But anyways, today it's all about the men. Where are the men at? All right, let's settle down. Settle down, my jeans. We're, we're, we're going to have, after this, I don't know how you're going to feel about it, but we'll, we'll, we'll go there. We'll go there. Just kidding. Um, I want to be able to tell you guys first, I uh, have been sick this whole entire week uh, with medications and uh, all antibiotics. I've, I've been like Lazarus. I'm coming out of the tomb today. So I'm not on my 100, so pray for me. Uh, for me to be able to do God's will because the work has to go on whether I feel 100 or I feel at zero. I still have to do what God has called me to do. So can you please extend your hands and pray for me that God will give me the strength and the wisdom to continue. Father God, I here stand in your presence to deliver the word that you have given to the men in this church. I ask you, God, to give me the strength to continue to deliver that word in an effective manner so they be able to uh, understand and that seed may be sown in their hearts to be able to become kingdom men. Thank you for all that you're going to do. In Jesus' name I pray. And everyone said? Amen, amen, amen. amen. Again, where are my kingdom men at today? That was, what? Okay. All right. <laughs> I'm going to start with the same question that my wife did. You know, what comes into mind whenever you hear the word righteous man? What does a righteous man look like? What, a, what does a kingdom man look like? And man, the first thing that pops out in my head, obviously, some of you will be like, Jesus, Jesus the righteous man. All right. I know the answer is always Jesus, but let me, let, let's go a little bit deeper. You, you got that. You got that. Yes, Jesus. But besides Jesus, righteous man, kingdom man, what does that look like? For us, for you men, you might think of Samson. You know, all muscle and no brain. All right, sorry, sorry. It's, the medicine is taking over. I'm sorry. All muscle and power and anointing that with a jaw of a donkey he slew a thousand Philistines and just one souvenir and break a sweat. Because he was anointed, you're like, man, that anointed that dripped over because he was a Nazarene made him a righteous man before God. He had to be righteous because he did all that. But his actions of, I am a righteous, what I was called to do was kind of overshadowed by the desires of what he wanted. We looked at the big picture. He was strong. He was powerful. But he was, most of those stuff... He wouldn't have gotten into, he was seeking a woman. Let me be honest with you. He wouldn't have had to do it. He wouldn't have to like, how many times did they not like, they put him on ropes to try to catch him because, you know, Delilah was like, hey, not, what's your secret? And he was like, I love you, so I'll tell you. You know, it, it completely just takes away the whole righteous. I look at Samson now and be like, wow, you're so strong. And then mentally... And emotionally, you're weak. You're weak. To fall for someone that will put your ministry in a position that will diminish what God wants to do, that's a weak man. It doesn't matter how many Philistines you kill. It doesn't matter how strong you are. You're weak. Because spiritually, mentally, and emotionally... You put your ministry or the purpose that God has put in your life at risk for your desires. The man just completely left the building at this point. Talk to me, guys. Am I right or am I wrong? So I say, you know what? He's just not it. Let me just, let me just kick him out of it. You may think of David. Fought the lion with his own hand. Rip it out, the bear, slew the giant, became king, a man after God's own heart. He became, he was the most beautiful, the forgotten one, the last child. He also had a problem with women. And because of his desires, he put at jeopardy not only the calling of God in his life, but he put at jeopardy the kingdom of Israel as well. This is a contrast of my leaders. 
or leaders. The higher you go in the ladder, the more God will demand of you. That not as only because the anointing is on your life, but because you have a moral dilemma. You have a moral thing that you must present in God to see if your emotions and your decisions align with the will and the purpose that God has for your life. Because you cannot proceed or proceed with the purpose that God has given your life when your moral standards are not to the standards of God. Do you hear me? I cannot proclaim that I am a man after God's own heart when in my heart I still lust after other women. I cannot proceed to be able to lead others into who becoming men of God when in my own understanding I doubt if I am a man of God. I cannot speak life unto others or my children when I do not even know how to lead myself into the presence of God. Can I get an amen? Amen. David did good, and the Bible doesn't discount it, but it tells us that the moral failures of David passed on to the next generation to come. You may think of Solomon, the most wisest man, and the most thing, you know, the one thing that God was like, because you ask wisdom to lead my people, I will give you all the wisdom and all the riches. That is great. But in all his wisdom, the sermon failed Solomon. He wasn't a great fighter. He wasn't a great singer. He was, had the knowledge to be able to make the right judgment. When it came to make judgment upon himself, he failed as a moral man of God. He decided that having 700 plus women was the right ideal to be able to become a kingdom of peace. The more I marry the woman, the more connections I have with the kingdom. Everybody's a okay But that put at risk the kingdom of God. That put at risk the calling that God has given him in his life. And I'm here to tell you, men, it doesn't matter what calling you have. It doesn't matter how strong you are. It doesn't matter how wise you are. If you within yourself and your moral compass is not right with the Lord, you're still not a man of the kingdom of God. Do you hear me? You may be able to expose and see others the fakeness that you put in your life, how strong you are and how pretty your words are and how much wisdom you have in the world and how much wisdom you have in the things of God. But when it comes to your alone time, when you close the door and pick up the phone to that website that you know you shouldn't have, where is the wisdom, the strength? Where is the discernment that God? Where is the anointing of God when you would decide to walk and fail morally before the presence of God. I heard a, a, a if I can call him a pastor, a pastor say that it doesn't matter how much a man fails. You can be sinning, but the anointing will never go away. Because the anointing is given to do what you have to do. I don't, I don't my mind does not get together with that. Because if that was true, then Samson wouldn't have asked for God for strength again to be able to finish what he has started. Then Saul would not have, the Spirit of God would not have left him when he failed to God then David would not have to plead and go fasting and pray because his son was proclaimed by God to die because of his things, then that would not have happened. If anointing stays with a man no matter what he does, then the failures of other men in the Bible will not have to be mentioned because God will always do whatever he wants and it doesn't matter what you do. 
I don't think that works, man of God. I think the reason why we don't see kingdom of man stand is because we have decided that the outward and the things that are external are the ones who makes us kingdom man. The way I dress, the way I speak, the things that I have in order, the things that are outwardly nice are the things that make us holy before the Lord. But I'm here to tell you that it is the opposite, that the kingdom man or the righteous man is not an outwardly position, but an inward position with the Lord. It is a right standing of your heart. It is a heart posture. It is the thought that becomes the word. It is the heart that leads the man to the right path. That makes a man a righteous man. It is not how much you know. It is how much you're willing to discern what is good for you. For Apostle Paul tells you that everything is available for us, but not everything is good. So if everything is okay for us, but not everything is good, that calls us into question, then what is your moral and your discernment like? What is it, how easy it is for you to discern what's good and what is bad? It's not a question if you can sing, if you can preach, if you can read the Bible. The question is, how do you apply it to my life? How do I discern according to the Word of God what the will of God is for me? What the Word of God said, transform your mind. How does it mean that to transform your mind? It means that the systems that you have used before to judge certain things are not the right thing when it comes to discerning from God. That God discerns not as men discern in this world, but as a God who's the righteous, separated from all evil, understands what good and evil is. Do you hear me? This is why, man, God has called us to be holy. Because if we continue to taint our mind, our emotions, we'll continue to dabble with the things of this world and ease on them things that maybe it's not a big thing, but we know that it's wrong. If we continue down that path, that there's a line that you cross that is no longer black or gray or white, it's, it's a gray area. It might be drinking, it might be what partying, it might be whatever it may be, but the discernment of a man will start getting cloudy. We start making excuses for some of the things that we know that it is not right. This is why, man of God, I tell you that you need a deeper connection with the Holy Spirit because it says in the Word that He will guide you into all truth. If someone that does not know how to discern the truth from faith, from fantasy, then I need a compass to always point me north, to always point me to the right path, to, uh, to be the lamp unto my feet. And there is only one person given to man to be able to be guided into all truth, and that is the Holy Spirit. Are you with me, man? This is Joseph's introduction. I'm not finished with you yet. Would you go with me to the book of Matthew? I'm going to show you what a righteous man really looks like. Matthew chapter 1, we're going to go to verse 18. When you have it, say amen, and we'll stand in reverence to the word of God. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. I'm going to show you what a real righteous man looks like. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, when you have it, say amen, and we stand in reverence of the word of God. This is what Matthew chapter 18, sorry, not chapter 18, chapter 1, verse 18 says, this is how Jesus, the Messiah, was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph, but before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant 
through the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse 19. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man. I'm going to say that one more time. Verse 19. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man. I did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. Verse 20. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus. For he will save his people from their sin. Verse 22. All this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. But he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born. And Joseph named him Jesus. You may be seated. According to the book of Matthew, according to Matthew himself, the first righteous person in his book was Joseph. Now, we don't hear about Joseph a lot. We hear about Mary. We hear about Jesus. But when it comes to Joseph... The Bible only gives us so much of him. We know that through the Bible that he was a carpenter. And we know that he was a righteous man. But I want you to understand that the mind of Joseph and where Joseph was led to be righteous. Number one, he was righteous because he loved God. He loved the law. He kept the law. But this was not where his righteousness was tested. Hear me. Every man that follows God, every man that keeps the commandment, it is righteous before God because of the sacrifice and everything that he does. But that is not when the righteousness of Joseph were tested. The righteousness of Joseph were tested within this verses that we just spoke about. While there was, he was still engaged to be married to Mary, she was a virgin and became pregnant. I want you to imagine a young man, yeah, knowing that his soon-to-be wife is telling him, Joseph, I am pregnant. Now, I don't know about you, but you will lose your righteousness right there and then. You will be in Jerry Springer. You will be in the Maury Shore. He is not the daddy. You will divorce and walk out. You will tell all your body how of a lady of a street she was. And how you can't trust these ladies of the street anymore. How all women are the same. How you can't trust no one today. But the righteousness of, jo of Joseph was tested right there. That's not what he did. What he did, he said, I am going to quietly divorce her. The law of God said if that happened, I was legally okay to stone her to death because that meant adultery. So Joseph, as a righteous man who followed the word of God, could have picked up the stone, picked up other men, and said, we are going to kill Mary because according to the word of God, this is what is supposed to be done. But Joseph said, I am not going to do that because I love her. 
because I'm attached to her. I think I'm going to quietly divorce her. And the Bible says, while Joseph was pondering about this. See, Joseph didn't make a decision right away. Joseph did not, was, was not led by his emotions at the moment that he received it. He didn't act on anger or jealousy or whatever it may be and pushed her away, called her name, picked up a stone, stoned her, told everybody, I'm, I'm going to divorce her, took her to her family and said, what kind of daughter have you given her? No, the Bible says that he went home and pondered about this. He prayed about it. He went to the Lord and said, Lord, you know, uh, this is what I'm willing to do. He started to think. He started to use the discernment. Now, many of you would not have done that because why would I go against the word of God? The word of God said to stone her, I will follow the word of God. But there are some circumstances that we need to seek the God of Israel, the God of the universe, to understand the scripture that I desire mercy. So Joseph did not blow up. Joseph withheld his anger. Joseph said, I am going to put it all in, and I'm going to ponder and take it upon God. And while this was happening, it's not known how many days, how many weeks. He said he pondered, and when the night came, a dream came. And the angel of the Lord told Joseph, Joseph, this baby is God's baby. Joseph, I need to, you to do two things. I want you to go against everything culturally that tells you what to do. And I want you to follow what I tell you to do. I want you to override your feelings. I want you to override your thoughts. And I want you to marry her. And I want you to name the child Jesus. Now, culturally, that's all wrong. Because people will talk. They haven't gotten married. Well, how is she pregnant? Did they commit adultery before they got married? Did she commit adultery before he got married? Why is Joseph with her? Why is Joseph naming him Jesus when the culture is it's naming him after the, the father? This is why when Elizabeth had a baby... They spoke to Zachariah and was like, why, why are you naming him John? There's nobody in your family named John. You're not named John because the culture was you name it either after yourself, the father, or after someone in the family. So him, Joseph, coming and saying, I'm going to name him Jesus, is, is raising flags all over the culture. All the men are going to question, what is Joseph doing? Did you not think that Joseph question maybe he woke up and some days he was like you know what did God really say that was this all just a dream do you not think other people other men came to Joseph maybe Joseph's father or best friends during the wedding and said hey, she, does she look pregnant to you no 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 you know it's, it's God's baby come on Joseph I see Mary go around sometimes Do you not think, come on, man, do you not think that that stuck in his head? That maybe she's lying to me. Maybe she's not faithful to me. Maybe he became a little paranoid that every time she looked at another man, weird, like, maybe you want to keep her close because you never know what's happening. But Joseph did something so out of normal. That made him a righteous man before God. He didn't worry about culture. He didn't worry about his feelings or his thoughts. He worried about being obedient to God. That's the first point that I want you to get with me, man. That being a righteous man, being a kingdom man, it's all about being obedient to God. <clears throat> the 
Joseph made a decision to be righteous in his relationship with Mary. To be her husband. To be the protective man. To be the supportive man that even though this is not my child, even though the promise was, was for, I mean, I would think that it's, it's God using Mary, not God using me. Mary got pregnant. Mary will give birth. What am I supposed to do? Joseph became the father on earth of the son of God. Can you feel how heavy the burden it is for a high priest, the head of the household, to teach the Son of God the statutes, the righteousness, the stories, the ceremonies, to follow God? That was not falling on Mary. That fell on Joseph to teach him what's right and what's wrong. To teach him to follow God with all his heart and with all his mind. That must have been the hardest thing that you could ever imagine. Because Jesus might not, not look like Joseph. But Joseph made him his own. This is mine. He could have treated him bad. He could have been like, that's not my problem. Because all I have to do is marry her and name him Jesus. That's all the angel told me to do. Everything else is up to her to do. But I'm here to show you and to tell you that Joseph went further than that. Because kingdom men, the desire to do the will of God goes above every little thing. We don't stop short of doing what God has called us to do. If a man asks you for a shirt, give him a cloak. If God asks you to go one mile, go two miles. What does that teach us? That we have to go the extra mile. It's not just barely doing what I have to do. It means that I will go on to do what I even I can't do. Even when my emotion says I can, I will. Because I am obedient to God. Do you hear me, man? This is where the sermon comes from. When I no longer need or hear my emotions, but I put aside. So God is able to speak to me and be obedient to him. Being obedient to God will never agree with your emotions. Can you write that down for me, man of God? Being obedient of God will never align with your emotions. But will challenge them. Will test them. That is what a righteous man becomes. A righteous man and tested when the fire comes in, when the doubt comes in, when your emotions comes in, when the anger comes, it comes in, when the exhaustion comes in, when you're so tired that you, have you ever experienced that? When you're so tired is when the enemy attacks the most. And I think Joseph might have been tired of the rumors and the looks, and the judgment. The Bible said he never quit. Did you know that Joseph redeemed Jesus? What does that mean, Pastor Mike? By the law, firstborn male that opens up the womb belongs to the Lord. Because of what happened in Egypt, the Lord decreed, and I will give you in just a bit the verse. The Lord decreed that every firstborn belonged to the Lord because he saved them in Egypt. He killed every firstborn, but in every doorpost that had the blood, the firstborn was saved, but it belonged to the Lord. Listen to this. I'm going to explain it. I'm going to give you the verse. Every clean animal 
that was a firstborn. Listen, every clean animal that belonged, that opened up the wound and that was clean was from the Lord. So what did the Israelite needed to do? They came with the animal and sacrificed it to God because no one was allowed to use them because they belonged to the Lord. Two exceptions. An animal that was unclean could not be sacrificed to the Lord. So it must be redeemed. Well, that does that mean? It must be bought back from God. God won't accept it, but it belongs to the Lord. So when a donkey was born, a firstborn donkey, you could not. It was unclean to the Lord. So the Israelite, it still belonged to God. So the Israelite needed to bring a lamb that was perfect and needed to sacrifice the lamb to redeem the donkey. It belonged to God, but because I gave and I paid now the donkey belongs to me. That what is called redeem, they pay the price. The other thing that the Lord did not like was human sacrifice. So with a firstborn male that belonged to God, the Lord would not accept the sacrifice. So the parents, when it was a month old, needed to bring it to the front of the altar of the Lord, to bring it to the synagogue, to present what belonged to God. Then they needed to pay money. The price that God had put in order to redeem that life, and now it's mine. It was God, but now it's mine. Go with me to Numbers chapter 18. Numbers chapter 18, verse 15, when you have it, say amen. With me. Number chapter 18, verse 15 says this. This is a law. This is God proclaiming what we must do. He says, the first offspring of every womb, both human and animal, that is offered to the Lord is yours. But you must redeem every firstborn son and every firstborn male of unclean animals. See that word redeem. Before he said he needs to be offered to the Lord in verse 15. And now here at the end it says you must redeem every firstborn son Every firstborn male of an unclean animal. Verse 16. When they, when they are a month old, you must redeem them at the redemption price set at five shekels of silver according to the sanctuary shekel which weighs about 20 gerahs. So according to it, according to how much it weighed, you needed to pay for them. If you keep reading Exodus and Leviticus, and you keep reading because it repeats numbers. If I did not want to redeem a donkey, a donkey was an unclean animal. If it was firstborn, I need to take it to the Lord. I need to be able to redeem it with a sheep or money or whatever it is. If I did not want to do that, the high priest... Or the guy, usually the owner, must break his neck and kill the animal. Because no one was allowed to use what was God's. I don't want to break Jesus' neck. It was a decision that Joseph had to make. Do I now pay for something that is not mine? Do I, in front of the law, make him my son on earth? And if I have to do that, I'm willing to have to sacrifice and pay to make it recognized that now he belongs to me. 
that I will cover him, that I will teach him, that I will protect him, that he will be also known. Isn't his father Joseph the one carpenter? Isn't he came from that? Everybody will know. Joseph had a decision to make. Do I override my emotions? Do I go against everything do I believe? Do I sacrifice for something that is not even mine? The Bible says that at a month old, they took Jesus to the temple. That there were two prophets of the Lord that prophesied, this is the Lamb. I've seen the redemption of Israel. They were there to redeem Jesus. Joseph went above and beyond every emotion, every idea, every thought, so the purpose of God could be done on not just his life, but of the life of Jesus. And because a righteous man decided that it is not about me, that is about somebody else's purpose, then we can say Jesus was perfect in all things. He completed the law in every single thing. In the things that he didn't even have an option to do. Jesus couldn't walk at a month and go by himself to the, to the temple and say like, redeem me, redeem me. Here's the money. No, he needed righteous man who will stand up to do the will of God no matter how he felt that it wasn't about him. It wasn't going to get him any richer. It wasn't going to get him any status. It wasn't going to make him more wiser. It did not give him anything. But he made it so that Jesus was able to fulfill his purpose. A righteous man will sacrifice himself for the goodness of others. Do you hear me, people? My married men, you will have to sacrifice your desires and your emotions in order for the woman, your wife, to be able to go along their purpose, to be able to serve her in another way. That is what righteousness man will do. I will sacrifice. Many of us got it all wrong. Many of us say, because I'm the high priest, it's what I want, when I want, and nothing else. Serve me. Do whatever I need to tell you to do. I lay down the law your children need to obey. But I'm, what I'm here to tell you is not all about that. Joseph needed to sacrifice something out of himself so that someone else was able to fulfill the promises of God. It does not matter that Mary gave birth. It does not matter that the people said this was the Son of God unless he was redeemed by law and follow every single thing by the letter he would have broken. He could not have been perfect. He could not have been used because he couldn't be alive. But Joseph didn't think about himself. Joseph decided that I am going to do what God has told me to do. Now, let me tell you something because, Pastor Mike, what are you talking about? If you go to Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 to 25, Gabriel never said, redeem the son. Gabriel never gave instructions to go back to Jerusalem. And he, he, no, he said, name him Jesus, Mary, Mary. So what are you talking about that, that Joseph did what God has called him to do? There are some things, man, that it, it just, it, it, in Spanish we say, se caen de la mata. It's just so obvious for you to do that you don't need to be like, well, God didn't tell me to do it. You do it because it's righteousness, because of your righteousness, because it's the right thing to do. David should have understood that he shouldn't have been looking what he needed to be looking. He knew that within himself he needed to make that decision. But no one was looking. <coughs> but nobody was paying attention. What is the decision that you're going to make? The decision that David made 
Think about this. The decision that David made for himself. I want Bathsheba. I want her. I want her. And I don't care. I'm the king. I'm going to have her. But the decision that he made not only affected him and affected her because her son died, affected the kingdom of God. Do you hear me? As a man of God, as the head of the household, your responsibility does not fall on you. Just like Aaron was anointed from the head and it dripped all the way down to his to his toes all the anointing fell from him and his son so will your mistakes will cause somebody else's because your absent father your children will suffer because you don't know how to express love your household will suffer because of the decisions that you made, your household will suffer. But it's not written, Pastor Mike. It's not, it is because doing the right thing is knowing when to follow God. It's knowing what he would do. You're the high priest and you're meant to look out for everyone under your authority as a man of the house. Sometimes that means sacrificing. Sometimes that means holding on your tongue. Sometimes that means waking up and going to do something that you very well don't want to do. Sometimes is, man, you went to sleep so late and your wife would be waking you up because she wants you to cut the grass or she wants you to pick up the mail and you're like, you can do it too. You know, I'm tired, but doing the right thing is waking up and doing what is right. Don't say you're the head of the household when what you're doing is being a dictator. I'm the leader. You do what as, as you're told. You want to become a leader? Learn what it is to serve. Jesus says from himself, those who want to become first will be last. I didn't come to serve, but to be served, to serve others. Your responsibility as the high priest of the household is not just give command, but to serve your fellow people, to lead them where they're down, whether you're emotional. Listen to me, men of God, and I hope you write it. Whether your emotions like it or not, it does not matter. My emotions do not matter. My thoughts do not matter. Because if I am to model Jesus, do you think he wanted to be crucified? Do you think his thoughts wanted him to be crucified? Do you think that his emotions led him to be crucified? No. He went to the mount. He cried. He sweat. He said, Father, if you're willing to give this out to me, please take that cup. But your will be Done. Not my emotions, not my wants, not my desires, not my thoughts. Your will be done. In that moment, the Holy Spirit must have taken over, given him a supernatural strength. Did, did, did he take away the emotions? Absolutely not. Did he take away the thoughts? Absolutely not. Was he hungry, thirsty, and tired? Absolutely. Did he stood up, got arrested, carry the cross, died? Yes, he did. Because it's not what I feel, but I have a purpose to do. And my purpose is for others. The purpose of Jesus was not for himself. The purpose of Jesus was not to redeem himself. The purpose of Jesus not to gain salvation. The purpose of Jesus not to gain the crown. The crown was his. He took the crown to serve other people. So men of God, take down your ego. Take down your emotions. Take down your anger. Take down your jealousy. Take down whatever puts you in a high horse and level down and serve the person who's next to you. That's how you became a righteous man. It is not about us, but about what God had designed for us. The kingdom of 
God is waiting for righteous kingdom men to step off the high horse that is all about me and what they did and what they must do and take it up and serve one another in love. Not of, of something that I need from them. Do you hear me? And Joseph didn't receive the glory. Didn't have a full chapter written about him. Didn't have a whole book written about him. We don't even know how he died. We don't even know when he died. But we know that that's the first man that Matthew said that he was righteous. And I don't know about you, but that's all I need. For a sentence to say, and Michael was righteous. And Julian was righteous. And Jonathan was righteous. And Chris was righteous. And Ivan was righteous. And Manny was righteous. And Isaac was righteous. And Travis was righteous. And Isaiah was righteous. And Kenneth was righteous. And Sane was righteous. That's all I need. I don't need to be famous. I don't need to have a platform. I don't have to need followers. I don't need people to have a whole crowd that is ready to serve me. I don't need all that. All I need to know is that Jesus, God, right in the book of the Lamb, and Michael was righteous. And Michael took off the anger and serve. And Michael took off the jealousy and serve. And Michael took off his emotion and serve. And Ma Michael took off the pityness he had for himself and serve. Because if it's not about sacrificing, if it's not modeled by what Jesus did, then what are we doing, man? What are we doing? There are people around you looking up to you. If you did not have a father in your life and you know how hard it is to not have someone to look up to, let me tell you right now that there are people around you looking up to you right now to see how you will act. Maybe it's not a brother because you have one, but maybe it's a co-worker. Maybe it's a fellow church member. Maybe it's a young man. Maybe it's someone that you just met. Maybe... It's someone who is looking through social media to see if you're just into yourself or you are proclaiming the kingdom of God. What does your social media declare? Is it how good I look? How much money I have? My car? My house? Because for me, that might be a stumbling block for another person. That might be, I can't attain it. That's what a man of God is. I can't have that. We are to testify. We are to proclaim the kingdom of God. Man, let us be real of who we are. It is a struggle. It is a dog-eats-dog dog world out there. It is hard for us to be men in a society that's trying to defend what man really is. It's hard to us to listen to God when there's everybody else in the world screaming that we don't even know who God is. We don't even know if God exists. But a basic, can you write this down? But the basic understanding of knowing who God is is what Joseph did. He was obedient to the word of God and followed his decrees. It is a basic fundamental understanding of who you are as a man, as a man of God, and who you follow. It is a fundamental, listen to me, it is the foundation to knowing who you are 
in God. So men of God, where is your time with God? Men of God, where is your intimacy with God? Can God walk up into your dream and talk to you about something? Or you're dreaming about women or sexual things or about uh, cars or doing this or how? Purify your thoughts. Sanctify yourself. And you will see the Lord move like never before in your life. Man of God, there is a need of you in this age. Rise up. Take the position that God has given to you from the very beginning. Stop pitying yourself. Stop making excuses. Because Joseph did not make excuses. Joseph worked hard and provided for Jesus, for Mary, for all of the other sons. He woke up every single day and teach them. Took him, learned the word of God. He did what he had to do with what he got. He lived trying to explain to everybody that Jesus was his. No matter if the math didn't add up, Jesus was his. It's up to you, men of God, to rise up and to lead the kingdom of God and the church to the next generation. It's up to you, men of God, to be tired of the cycle of, of other kids that having that or having a mentor or having a father figure in your life. You could be that person. You, just like Joseph, can adopt somebody else and say, I will take you under my wing and I will teach you the decrees of God and I will teach you how to walk in the, decree, in the righteousness of God because I walked it, because I am obedient to the Lord, because I kept his word, because I decided it's not about me, it's about it's about what God wants to do and this young man that has no father, that has no mother, that he needs to carry out the next generation of the church. He needs to learn how to carry the grace and the power of God. He needs to learn the intimacy of what it is to seek the Lord. And in instead, you're sitting here pitying about yourself that you still don't have a dad, that you still do this and that, and you don't have that and this, and you're no longer what to do, and the next generation is dying because the next generation, fewer men stand up. Fewer men stand up. Fewer men stand up. And then we regard women and we fight with women when they're here serving the Lord where all they can. They have taken your position and then we point them saying that that's not from God. You should not be doing that. You should not have a pastor as a woman pastor. You should not have a leader as a woman. But well, where are you men of God? Sitting in a corner crying. Where are you, men of God? Stand up and do what's right before the Lord. And know that it is not about you. It's about the purpose that God has for the kingdom and for the church. Stand up and rise up for the times are short. We have to wake up, men. And the time is now. Stand up with me today.